It was days of printing, laminating, and binding. And weeks of reading. But this is part one of Russell Lafitte's Federal Appeal Brief. Both sides filed for permission to exceed the allowable amount of pages, and defense buried the government in six appendices that totaled 3,354 pages. I was waiting for the government response to make my podcast because I wanted their reply to the allegations made by defense. Most of the pages in the appendices are court transcripts, which are great because federal court still doesn't allow filming, limiting the amount of people who heard every word of testimony and the amount of information that was reported on. I've already read Arthur Badger's testimony in an earlier podcast, and it was just one of many jewels in this trial. I'll be doing a separate series called Cassidy Reads where I will read each person's testimony as well as bits like opening and closing statements for you to listen to while you drive or do other things because it's very eye-opening. It made me realize more than ever that Russell wasn't just a doe-eyed friend that got taken advantage of or an accomplice that got tempted by Alex's promise of money but rather, in many cases, the mastermind of the theft and the very reason Alex was able to get away with the stealing for so long. But here, in his attempt to appeal his sentence, his attorneys try to paint a picture of a helpless babe preyed upon by Alex, another victim, if you will. But the story of Russell's involvement needs to reach a larger audience than it's managed to reach to this day. Let's get started. This is Legal Updates, An Innocent Victim or a Mastermind, Russell Lafitte's Appeal, Part 1. Welcome. His brief was filed quite some time ago, but I was waiting for the response from United States Attorney Burroughs Office, and it was filed on March 26th. It's 126 pages, with some redactions throughout, and it covers one by one the issues raised by Lafitte's team on his appeal. But before getting into that, it starts with an introduction of what this case is about. Russell Lafitte worked his way up through the ranks of his family's bank in Hampton, South Carolina, eventually becoming its CEO. Then, he used his position to help Alex Murdaugh, the now infamous South Carolina attorney, steal nearly $2 million from his clients. Their scheme dates back to 2011. Murdoch would have Lafitte appointed as conservator or personal representative for Murdoch's clients. Lafitte then extended himself and Murdaugh loans from conservatorship accounts Lafitte was charged with managing, and he helped Murdaugh steal from other clients to pay them back. Murdoch made sure Lafitte was paid handsomely for his services. The scheme unraveled in 2021 when Alex's firm uncovered the thefts and Lafitte's bank discovered Lafitte's role in them. For his part, Murdaugh has pleaded guilty to dozens of financial crimes in both state and federal court. Lafitte was separately indicted and went to trial. After the jury heard from two dozen government and defense witnesses and saw over 300 exhibits during nearly three weeks of trial, they reached the only conclusion supported by the evidence. Guilty on all counts. Lafitte argues he was simply caught in the web of deception that Murdaugh weaved. To be sure, these crimes would not have happened without Alex Murdaugh, but they could not have happened without Russell Lafitte. Lafitte has now challenged his convictions in six rounds of post-trial briefing with the benefit of nine attorneys. His claims remain unpersuasive. He contests 19 of the district court's rulings, but most of his arguments are waived or forfeited, and not one of them undermines the conclusion that he was provided a full and fair trial in front of an impartial jury of his peers. His convictions should be affirmed. In the next portion of the document, it's the statement of the issues, and there are five issues. The first one is completely redacted, so at this point we have no clue what they are. But number two 
is whether Lafitte waived his challenges to the replacement of two jurors by consenting to the procedure the court used to remove them, and if not, whether the district court abused its significant discretion by excusing them based on legitimate medical issues. So if you're not familiar with his trial, two jurors were removed very late in the game. So this is the second issue they list as making him eligible for appeal. Now we'll get into what happened and even read some of those transcripts later. The third issue is whether the district court abused its discretion by excluding evidence when after several opportunities, Lafitte failed to show it was probative of motive or bias for the government's witnesses, and the court found it would have led to a trial within a trial and confused the jury. We'll get into this one too in a little more detail in a moment. The fourth issue, whether the evidence was sufficient to convict Lafitte of bank and wire fraud or aiding and abetting bank and wire fraud, where the government's 15 witnesses and 222 exhibits proved Lafitte took affirmative steps and made misrepresentations in furtherance of an extensive scheme to defraud Murdoch's clients. And the last one, whether the district court plainly and reversibly erred by waiving interest on Lafitte's restitution order without first finding Lafitte is unable to pay as required by statute. So those are the main issues that they're going to address. The next portion is statement of the case. Lafitte and Murdoch grew up across the street from each other, and their family's relationships go back generations. And this is from Russell Lafitte's testimony, where he's describing his relationship with Alex. It says, I don't know if y'all realize this, but I know y'all realize we grew up next door to each other, literally across the street. And he's my father's godson, and I'm his father's godson. So you know we have tight ties. I never was really close to him. I was close to his younger brother, John Marvin, which you all met the other day. Alex is three or four years older than me. I think three years older to be exact. So when I was coming into getting big enough to play basketball or football and all, you know, they were a lot older. You know how the growth differences are in kids. And I never went, like if I was coming in freshman in high school, he was a senior. So we never really did a lot. Whereas his brother, I was the same age. However, being in the same town, we know each other. And he was a partner at the law firm PMPED. And so obviously I knew him since they are our largest private customer in Hampton County and probably might be in the whole bank, bank wide. So I did know him from there and we had, you know, I banked him. I was his banker or whatever you want to call it. You know, one of my things, I catered to the law firm. You know, they were good clients, and I wanted to cater to them and make sure that they stayed good clients. We kept a lot of loans, a tremendous amount of deposits. I actually know that, but I don't know if I can say that in public, or I don't think it's really necessary. Y'all understand, they had a lot of loans and a lot of deposits, and we wanted to keep them. So yes, he was one of my clients, along with many, many of the other attorneys. It wasn't just Alex. It next refers to Russell's father's testimony, Charles Lafitte, who says, When we moved to Hampton in 1963, they moved right across the street from us shortly after that. And their children and my children all grew up just about the same age and knew them all my life. I mean, recently, I say recently within the last five years, I guess, Alex and his family moved out into the Moselle area, which is about 20 miles from town. But before that, they were right there across the street from us. Back to the brief, Murdoch was a personal injury attorney at PMPED. He and his partner secured significant settlements in cases involving vehicle defects and car accidents. It refers here to Ronnie Crosby's testimony that this was the kind of law that this firm practiced. Murdoch and his firm were big customers of Palmetto State Bank, Lafitte's family's bank, where Lafitte had worked for decades. This was according to Jan Malinowski's testimony. And Lafitte was Murdoch's contact for all of his banking needs. That's according to Norris Lafitte's testimony. The pair capitalized on Murdoch's access to clients with large settlements and Lafitte's access to the bank. Together, they stole millions from clients to whom they both owed fiduciary duties. Now, going into this next part, they're going to summarize a lot of things that we already know, that we've heard so many times, I've reported on them so many times, so I'm not going to review all of the cases here today. For example, the first one it goes into is that in 2006, that Alex had Russell appointed as conservator for Elenia and Hannah Plyler. If you've not already heard that case, it's my very first victim story, 
and I apologize for the quality of my early videos. I did not have a good mic then. I was very new at this whole thing, and a lot of additional information has come out since I made those. So at some point, I will be updating them, but if you're not familiar with the Plyler Girl case, you can find it more easily by looking at playlist view of my channel. I've broken things down into different categories, as you can see here. So simply click on the victims category, and the Plyler Girls will be the first one there. So it gives an overall what's what about this case, what Alex's role was, and what Russell's role was in this theft. Or technically, in case of the Plyler sisters, it was a borrowing. It was technically loans but it was loans taken out without their knowledge or permission, and loans that really shouldn't have been given to Alex, because in many of the cases he was severely overdrawn. It's also what led to him stealing from many other clients because he had to repay these loans without sufficient income to do that. The next case is also a case that we're familiar with. I've done a victim story on Hakeem Pinkney. His cousin, Natasha Thomas, kind of gets clumped in with his story. And I feel bad because I did the same thing. I didn't give her a victim story of her own, but she kind of just blended in with Hakim's story because it was one accident that they were all involved in together. So I am going to spend a little bit of time on Natasha's story here. But as I said, she was in the accident with her cousin, Hakim Pinkney, and Hakim's mother, Pamela Pinkney, was driving. Their tire failed, and that's what caused the accident. And of course, they hired Alex, and that's what got us where we are. But remember, today's focus is about Russell, and Russell appealing, claiming to be innocent, claiming to be duped by Alex, and this humongous appeal that he filed with six volumes and over a hundred pages of a brief is an attempt to say, hey, I'm innocent. The important part about the Plyler sisters is that before Alex was loaned any money, Russell had already helped himself to multiple loans from their account. So all the evidence points to the fact that this whole scheme was actually cooked up by Russell and not Alex in the first place. So what did Russell do in the Natasha case that shows that he is not innocent? Let's start with this. Alex appoints Russell in September of 2010 as conservator for both Hakim and Natasha. Now in Hakim's case, as we know, after the accident, he was rendered a quadriplegic. His mother was severely injured in the crash as well and has undergone so many surgeries. I think it's something like 15 at this time. So she wasn't really in the position to be a conservator for Hakim. So he did need one. However, the interesting part about Natasha is that she was just a couple of months from turning 18 when he was appointed. Now remember, cases take a while to win. With her being just weeks away from being 18, there was no chance the money was going to come before she was 18, so there was no point to ever have appointed one for her. So because of this, on Russell's application to serve as Natasha's conservator, he writes her down as being several years younger than she actually was. Because they knew if they presented these papers in court and she was 18, they were going to ask, why is there a conservator? Or should ask, why is there a conservator? So not only was this done when it didn't need to be, Natasha was never informed that Russell was hired to be her conservator. So remember, Alex was hired in September of 2010, in December of 2010, which by this time, guess what? She had turned 18. She went to get a loan for school expenses. Now this is very common. It's called a pre-settlement loan. We heard in testimony that clients were often sent to Palmetto State Bank to get these pre-settlement loans. While they're waiting for a settlement, that's pretty much a sure thing. The bank will give them loans to support them in the meantime. So that's what she did. So Alex makes out a letter for her to take to the bank to get her loan. Now he addresses this letter to Russell Lafitte as conservator for Natasha, which he misspells. He leaves off the A. Now this girl's 18. She's traumatized. She's injured. And her injuries, from what I understand, are things that are going to be with her for the rest of her life. And I would venture to say that most 18-year-olds are not familiar with the term conservator. She probably thought it had something to do with her loan when she saw it on there. But in her application, she provided her date of birth. 
which showed that she was already 18 years old. Russell doesn't mention anything to her about being her conservator when he takes care of this, and this is the only time that he ever met or spoke to her. He charges her an 18% interest rate on this loan. This is so maddening because when he would take money from the Plyler girls to give loans to Alex or for himself, it was about 3%. But when these actual clients needed loans for anything, they paid these much higher interest rates. Now, Natasha's case gets settled about a year later. At that time, Russell signs a release as her conservator. But here's the thing. She was 19 years old. So by the time her money actually comes in, she's 19 years old, does not need a conservator. He never had to handle money on her behalf other than this loan, which was just handled like any old loan. She was an 18-year-old woman getting a loan, did not require a conservator. And here's the thing. He takes $15,000 in a supposed conservator fee from her settlement funds, though he never handled a single penny of her settlement. How did this judge approve these disbursement sheets? Looking at these papers, seeing her age, understanding fully what a conservator is for, and allowed him to take $15,000 for absolutely nothing. And then with her cousin Hakim, who passed away before he ever saw his money, he collected a $60,000 fee. Now, Hakim had passed away. What conservatorship duties did he have for Hakim? But he took $60,000. Point three is about him serving as conservator for Malik Williams. We'll get into some bigger details of that soon. Part four was the Donna Badger case. We've already heard about that many times. Point five is the situation with Chris Wilson. And then part A points to a specific time period in the Badger settlement. Now this comes after the firm starts to realize that Alex had stolen money. And the first case they looked into was the Arthur Badger case. And this was discovered by Jeannie Seconder, as most of us remember from the testimony. But who does she go to? Immediately, she talks to Russell. Because also, as most of us know, Russell is her brother-in-law. Would love to know how that conversation went. But after this conversation, this is when Russell starts acting very suspiciously. She's trying to get to the bottom of where all these Arthur Badger checks went to, because they didn't go to Arthur Badger. So she asks Russell, and he delivers all of these checks. And without being asked, he volunteers to pay the law firm $680,000. Of course, once somebody finally takes a look at the checks and sees that every single one of them, Alex blatantly signed in his own signature and deposited in one or more of his own bank accounts. None of these missing checks went to Arthur. So this was early October that Russell offers to pay this 680000 Then on October 28th, he just up and gives the law firm, as it's written here, this unsolicited check for $680,000. On the remitter line, he writes, Badger settlement from A.M. or Alex Murdoch misappropriation. He tells the firm that he's not run it by the bank's board. So where does this number, $680,000, come from? It's half of the amount of money that was supposed to go to Arthur Badger, which was $1,325,000 plus the $35,000 personal representative fee that he had taken out of Badger's money. Now remember, a personal representative is a person who's appointed to represent a deceased person. Arthur Badger is not deceased. He did not need a personal representative. So why was Russell being paid $35,000 from Arthur Badger's money to be his personal representative? And why was this not noted by anyone in the firm or by the judge approving these disbursement sheets? So even though he gives this money back to the firm, he takes no responsibility for the misappropriation of this money. He also doesn't admit that every single one of these checks that Alex cashed passed directly through him into Palmetto State Bank. And then they have the evidence of the emails that took place between Alex and Russell at this time of how that $1,325,000 was broken down and cut into smaller checks, which we've covered two times very completely in podcasts about Arthur Badger. And I've shown pictures of the checks in the email, so I'm not going to go into all of that again today. Now in part B is the discovery by the law firm that Russell had also negotiated over $600,000 of Hakim's and Natasha's money for Alex. But remember, 
were showing that Russell was not innocent because on December 22, 2011, he filed paperwork telling the probate court that Hakeem, because he'd passed, and Natasha, because she was age 19, that their conservatorships had never received any money because they hadn't. He closed Hakeem's because Hakeem had passed away, and he closed Natasha's because she had turned 18. However, just two weeks later, after saying no money had passed through their conservatorships, and that neither of them needed a conservator, and that he had not managed any money for either of them, that's when he collected the $75,000 in conservator fees from them. And that when Alex walked into the bank with the over $600,000 in settlement checks, Russell helped him to steal it. And when a smaller settlement amount came in in August of 2012, and Natasha was supposed to receive over $25,000, the firm issued that check through Palmetto State Bank. On the memo line, it said settlement proceeds, Natasha Thomas, and Russell cashed this check for Alex and helped him structure it over three separate days. And if we look at the footnote, we find out why Alex often restructured these amounts. Because banks are required to file currency transaction reports on cash transactions over 10000 So this is why Alex would say, hey, can you recut these checks? because he wanted to stay under those $10,000 so that it didn't get reported. And that takes us to part C, why Russell was so helpful about letting Alex cash these checks and restructuring them, because this is how they were paying back the loans that Russell had extended to him. And why was Russell so helpful to Alex? Because in July of 2011, that's when he himself had started taking personal loans from Hannah's conservatorship. He had taken out a loan at a bank with a much higher interest rate. He had credit card bills at a high interest rate. He wanted to renovate his kitchen and put in an in-ground pool. So he helped himself to their money to do that. In all, he took out six loans and renewed four, totaling approximately $355,000. So these outrageous PR fees and conservators fees, those went to paying back those loans from the Plyler girls. So he started that in July, and then in September of 2011, that's when he starts loaning their money to Alex. Often, they were used to cover Alex's outrageous overdrafts. In total, he extended Alex 16 unsecured loans worth approximately $960,000. And from almost every time he did one of these loans, it's because Alex was in overdraft, as we can see in this graph here. And now I told you we'd come back to this Malik Williams case, and here's where we are now. Malik Williams was a minor child who was injured in an auto accident. His father was deceased, and his mother was unable to be bonded, so Malik needed a conservator. The case had nothing to do with Alex Murdoch. It was tried by the now deceased Paul Dietrich. Paul reached out to Russell and asked him to serve as conservator. Now, this information will be found in Ronnie Crosby's testimony from this federal trial. So it will be one of the recordings that I make later, and you can listen to the whole story in full there. But basically, he himself had to go through the file because this was not one of his cases, so he knew nothing about it. Alex, as well, should have known nothing about this case. When Ronnie Crosby is asked, how did Alex know about this case? He says, None of the other lawyers in the firm knew about this case because it was Paul's case. That that information had to have come from Russell Lafitte himself. Russell was aware because he was the conservator for this case. So Russell takes 40000 from Malik's $60,000 settlement and loans it to Alex. And as the government states in this brief, that Alex had no reason to know that Lafitte was William's conservator, that the conservatorship existed, or that he could take a loan from it. Thus, the conservatorship loans were Russell Lafitte's idea. They point out that these conservatorship loans, even though they were done without anyone else's knowledge, they in themselves were not illegal. However, it's the way that they were paid back that was highly illegal because they were paid back with money stolen from the Badgers, the Pinkneys, and Natasha Thomas. But again, the only way Alex could have known about this money even being available was through Lafitte. Lafitte was not innocent. And as for the paying back, Russell was conservator for the Plylers. He was on paperwork 
as the PR for Arthur Badger, even though that wasn't necessary. He was familiar with that paperwork and that lawsuit. He was conservative for Hakeem, conservative for Natasha Thomas, even though she was of age by the time the money came through. But still, he had signed paperwork for all of these people. He was aware of their settlements coming in. Their names were on every single one of these checks on the memo line. He knew what Alex's state of finances was. He knew that Alex was constantly in a state of extreme overdraft. He knew because they were the bank, as they all admitted, that was used by Alex's law firm. So he knew the pay schedule. But every one of these checks came in. Alex signed for them. Alex cashed them. Russell put them towards whichever loans they needed to be put towards. There is no way he didn't see their names on the memo line. There is no way he didn't know those checks did not belong to Alex. He was in just as much of a hurry to cover his tracks as Alex was. And this paragraph just puts it all on the line. Russell collected approximately $458,000 in PR and conservator fees from the Plylers, Pinckney, Thomas, and Badgers. In exchange, he helped Alex steal nearly two million dollars. Then we have a footnote that says in February 2015, when Russell had to close Hannah's conservatorship, he advanced Alex $284,787.52 from a line of credit meant for purposes of farming. So basically a fraudulent loan because even with all of this stealing, they hadn't come up with enough to cover the amounts they had borrowed. Not innocent. Now, after the firm had started to uncover Alex's theft, as we know, Maggie and Paul were murdered in June of 2021, and Alex's financial situation started to unravel then. The board of directors of the bank got concerned because he did have a number of loans. So at a board meeting the next month on July 20th of 2021, Norris Lafitte asked the other board members whether anyone knew what was going on with Murdoch. Lafitte said, he was still working. He did not tell the board that he had just given Alex a bank loan on July 15th. He did not tell them that he had just wired $350,000 to Chris Wilson's law firm trust account because this was the time that the law firm was starting to realize they had not received the money from Chris Wilson's law firm. So, so as we saw in Chris Wilson's testimony, Alex was trying everything to get that money back to Chris. Russell did what he could but was unable to come up with enough to fully cover it. And that's when Alex told Chris Wilson that he was $192,000 short. This was the Ferris or the Mack truck case. And at this time, Alex was over $160,000 in overdraft. So now we come to August. The firm's concerned, Chris Wilson's concerned, the bank's concerned. Norris Lafitte sends out an email to the bank's executive committee asking them to prepare a summary of the bank's total exposure with regard to Alex. Barely an hour after this email is sent out, Russell transfers $400,000 in bank funds into Alex's account. At the time, Alex was $347,784.67 in overdraft. Does that sound like an innocent man? He is covering his tracks. But again, just as I say about the law firm, what kind of checks and balances were going on here? I've said it before in previous podcasts. When a teller comes up short at the end of a day, they launch a whole investigation into getting down to where that money is. But all of this money is not being noticed for all of these years? All of these overdrafts? This shifting money around? No one's noticing any of this? I pay better attention to my costs and taxes and receipts for this little YouTube channel than that law firm and that bank did for their millions. So shortly after that email, but still in August, the board gets an overview of Alex's loans. All together, they total $3,544,894. They also find out that in July, Alex had just received a $750,000 loan for beach house renovations for the Edisto house. Maggie had been the one renovating that house. Maggie was gone. So what was that money for? Russell leaves out that he had wired 350000 to cover Chris Wilson and the other 400000 to cover Alex's overdrafts. But now the board members want to see the paperwork for this $750,000 loan. But guess what? It's nowhere to be found. The board members could not believe it. Guess when the papers are finally done? A day after this board meeting. 
when this money was already long gone. On September 6th, Russell sends to his board of directors a press release announcing that Alex has resigned and entered rehab. Several of the directors respond expressing concern about Alex's loss of employment and the way it's putting the bank in a vulnerable position. Alex had never made a payment on that $750,000 loan. Next month, October 28th, now I guess they've finally paid attention to the books. The firm has realized that Russell had helped Alex steal the Badger settlement money. Russell's answer was writing $680,000 to losses other than loans from a 2013 case with Alex, 2013 being the Badger case. He says that the law firm and I agreed to split the loss and make the client whole. So this is what he's telling the bank. What he doesn't tell the board at the bank is where the $680,000 figure came from which is, as we mentioned earlier, half of the amount plus the $35,000 fee he'd taken to be personal representative when Arthur Badger is still alive and therefore did not need a personal representative. So rather than pay it back himself, he takes it out of the bank to cover that $35,000 that he basically stole. He leaves out the fact that this money went to pay back the Plyler conservatorship. He also doesn't show the board any of the Badger checks. These are the ones that he himself did the math to decide how to recut the checks. He's still trying to appear innocent. Then on December 1st of 2021, the firm realizes that Alex has misappropriated the Pinckney and Thomas settlement funds. Somehow, Russell's the one who hears about it first. I bet we know why. And then he sends the board another email saying we found another two settlements that were stolen. And he attaches copies of the checks converting the Pinckney and Thomas settlement funds. But he still doesn't explain to the board why he, Russell, sent the Pinckney and Thomas's settlement money to his own father, to Alex's father, to Hannah Plyler's conservatorship, and Malik Williams' conservatorships. And in one of my earlier podcasts, we covered this, how he dispersed that money, some to his own father, some to Alex's father, just as stated here. Well, that was enough. The bank finally realized that Russell was involved in this thievery. So they vote to sever their relationship with Russell in January of 2022. But still, Russell's father, brother, and sister don't vote to terminate him. Only the other board members do. And this right here is why Alex and Russell acted the way they did. Because even here, in the light of Russell's actions, his family thought he should stay. And so finally, later that year in September of 2022, Russell's charged in a second superseding indictment where he's named as a principal and as an aider and a better. He's charged with conspiracy to commit wire and bank fraud, bank fraud, wire fraud, and three counts of misapplication of bank funds, to which he pleads not guilty, and it goes to trial in November. The government called 15 witnesses. Five were members of the board of directors, two were from the law firm, four were victims, one was an FDIC expert, one worked for the bank, and two were from the FBI. Russell had eight witnesses who testified in his defense, his brother, his father, and sister, along with three bank employees and a character witness, John Marvin Murdaugh. And finally, an expert on probate matters. So that's the part about his charges. So this is a good place to stop for part one. We'll continue next time with the section of Russell Lafitte's complaints. Till then, this is Cassidy O'Connell saying stay well and stay tuned.